The following is an interview with London-based addictions doctor Sharon Koivu. As one of this country's loudest critics against so-called safe supply, and as someone who is on the front lines of battling the addictions crisis in Southern Ontario, there is perhaps no one better to speak to about safe supply than Dr. Koivu. The interview was filmed in London, Ontario last week when True North was in town to film a mini documentary on the harms of the safe supply experiment. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you can watch the full episode of Ratioed by clicking the link on the screen right now. And if you're watching this video on any other platform, be sure to follow the link to the Ratioed episode in the description of this video. Without further ado, here is Dr. Sharon Koivu on the dangers of safe supply. Sharon, first of all, you've been a loud critic of uh, safe supply programs in London and in, in general. Why do you feel so strongly about this issue? I think that I've really had the opportunity to see the harms from a physician level. I also lived within a kilometer of the intercommunity health where um, most of the prescriptions in this area have um, been given from where the main program is, and I've seen what happened to our community. I also have family um, who have lived experience with addiction and really feel that if it had been available when they were younger, I might not have all the family members that I have now. So I'm coming at it from many perspectives and from years of experience. On the case of, on the, on the situation with diversion, right, um, We've seen reports that the federal government has funded a report that tries to downplay the concerns of diversion. Whenever this issue is brought up, it seems the uh, true believers in safe supply always try to shoot down concerns about diversion. What is What should Canadians know about diversion, in your opinion? I think there are many things we need to know. One is that most diversion is not about compassionate sharing. Um, I think that's a myth. Um, most diversion really involves either selling or what I'm seeing a lot more of is actually forced diversion. When people walk into the drugstore with their prescription and then walk out, people know who they are. So a lot of people are more intimidated and don't have the opportunity to necessarily financially benefit, um, but are kind of forced to be giving up. Um, some of their um, prescription. So it's not necessarily even good for the people that are diverting. So um, it's really changed. I think what, what, when it first started, people were financially benefiting from diverting. And it's understandable. These can be people that are very marginalized and are um, in poverty and um, they have issues around housing insecurity and food insecurity. But the problem is that then we now have a lot of pills on the street. And what I've seen since diversion happened, I guess a few things. One is I first started seeing people developing infections from injecting the tablets. They're meant to be swallowed. And I started seeing very severe infections from injecting pills, primarily diverted, but even from people that were in the program. And the infections that I've spoken out the most about are infections of the spine. And they are, I've been doing palliative care and, and uh, addiction work for years, but infections of the spine are probably the, the, the worst suffering I see because they're so painful. If you think about a spine getting infected, that's your, your nerve center is being infected. They're extremely painful. But I've also seen people develop permanent paraplegia, so they can't walk, and even quadriplegia, so they're affected from the neck down. It really depends on where their infection is. And when I first started seeing this, people could really tell me that the only pill that they were injecting was Dilaudid. So the risk of an infection has been something that I've taken very, very seriously. The other thing that I've seen living in this neighborhood, living within a kilometer of intercommunity health where the main program started, when I first moved in, in 2015, I moved in knowing this might be an area where there was a supervised injection site. I support harm reduction and I have supported the concept of supervised injection sites. But what I saw after um, the Safe Supply program started was I literally had um, patients tell me they were leaving their houses, leaving apartments that they had to live in tents behind the pharmacy where a lot of the diversion was taking place. 
and living here, I saw that happen. When I moved in, there were no encampments in that parking lot area behind that pharmacy. And they really spread between sort of um, Adelaide Street and English. So even behind like the Palace Theater and all of that area, they, were, they developed encampments that weren't there before. And they were because when people um, were buying diverted drugs, they were more abundant and cheaper closer to the source. Um, so people moved there. Now, there's a lot of homelessness and there's a lot of issues around homelessness that are extremely important and I don't want to downplay them. But the attraction to having encampments in this area was largely about getting diverted, dilaudid from the Safer Supply Program. And encampments have with them so many harms, not just for the neighborhood, but certainly for the people that were living there. They're not, there's no ability for um, cleanliness or, or ability to um, use washrooms. So, so it became a very unsafe place that probably even contributed more to the infections that I was seeing. So how it's impacted the neighborhood as well. Living here, um, I watched that change. I watched more crime taking place. I don't think I know anyone who hasn't had a bicycle stolen that lived in this neighborhood. And it really, it changed gradually. And I think one of the concerns I have too, when we were talking about supervised injection sites, we had many town hall meetings. We engaged the community. We let them know about it. And we brought them in to talk about it. When this happened, most people didn't know what was happening. Most people weren't aware that there was a program where people were getting large amounts of drugs and walking out with them without them being witnessed. So the other thing that I see with, with diversion is we have patients come into the hospital and the amount they are prescribed is often in the neighborhood of 40 pills of Dilaudid a day. Sometimes, in addition to that, they're also on a medication called Cadian, which is a long-acting morphine. So 100 milligram tablets, sometimes nine of those a day as well. And then when we actually see what their body can tolerate, it's somewhere like, you know, nine or ten. So the amount that they actually could take without being harmful, without being toxic to them, is a third, a quarter of what they are being prescribed. So when we look at that, that becomes a lot of pills on the street. It's very, very dangerous for the street, and I'll talk about that more, but even for that person, because now they have to guess what is a safe dose for them. If they get sick, which is when I see them, they're actually tolerating less, and they're not really being um, educated in that you can get an overdose on the same dose if you develop a pneumonia or you develop um, a problem with your heart or uh, anything that affects your cardiorespiratory system. And I guess the other point about diversion is that it means we're creating a huge problem with more people becoming addicted. It used to be $20 for a pill. The last time I talked to somebody who could tell me with fairly good authority, you could get them for as cheap as $1. And that makes them very accessible. We know that if things are cheap and readily accessible, we understand this from tobacco, we understand this from our work with alcohol, that makes it more likely that new people are going to start using drugs and that people are going to use them recreationally and then develop an addiction. And that is exactly what I've seen. When I started my addiction work in 2012, almost everyone I saw had chronic pain and had been prescribed opioids from a physician for their chronic pain. And that had been what had introduced them to getting addicted. At that time, most of the people I saw also had severe trauma and, or intergenerational trauma. Now, most of the people I see that have started using opioids since 2016 started recreationally and often didn't know that it was dangerous. It's called safe supply. So people literally are thinking it's safe to take and that they won't get addicted and safe to inject because it's called safe supply. So my experience has been that I'm seeing a lot more people, young adults, that have addiction. And when we look at overdose deaths in London, in 2016, we were equal 
to Ontario. The rates of overdose deaths from toxicity of opioids was equal to the rest of Ontario. Now, in 2012, well, looking at the 2022 data, that's the latest I have, our overdose deaths are substantially higher than the provincial average. The other thing about um, our overdose deaths is I'm, we have a much higher rate of overdose deaths in people that are 15 to 24 and 24 to 45. So before 2016, we were lower than the provincial average. Now we're higher than the provincial average in those young age groups. And I think people are saying that, you know, it's not affecting young people. I'm seeing it affecting young people. I'm see and the, the data supports that it is affecting young people. And that is about having a lot of opioid on the street. Um, why is it that so many doctors are not willing to speak out against this? If they know that there is something wrong with it, it seems that there aren't many that are willing to speak out against it. Why do you think that is? I think that, I think that to a degree, some people don't understand what's happening. Um, having concerns about its risk doesn't mean that there aren't any benefits for some of the people that are involved. And I think that when people haven't really seen, when people haven't been to the hospital and seen people with a spine infection, they don't really understand how severe the consequences are. The other thing is, having lived here, it's completely different to live in a community, you know, a rural community or a gated community or even the other end of town. Um, I have family that live in a fairly similar social economic neighborhood to this and have no experiences like what it's like to live here. So they don't really understand the intensity of the problem. But I also think for physicians, there certainly are a lot more that are speaking up about their concerns. It has been a battle to speak out. I was shocked when I first started talking about my concerns about seeing people with spine infections. I was told, you know, I was, I was accused of saying that that wasn't true. And what's kept me going is that I know that it is true. I know that I am trying to put a voice for those people that I have seen suffer. And it's quite shocking to be criticized and called a fear monger when you're really just trying to express the, the suffering that you're seeing. That has stopped a lot of physicians. Also, I know personally physicians that are worried about their relationship. They work with Intercommunity Health. It's a great health center for many things. They don't want to be involved in saying things that seem like it's against the entire health center when really it's just about being concerned about a program. So there are many things that are keeping people silent, but more people are speaking out. The last question I have for you, Doctor, is what your message would be to cities who are looking at adopting similar policies of safe supply policies? What would be your message to those cities? I think the first thing is make sure that you have really good treatment facilities available. In London, for example, where we have a robust safe supply program, we do not have a robust rapid access addiction medical treatment center open seven days a week. Put enhancement in the things we know that works. We know that Suboxone and Supplicade save lives. There's lots of evidence to show that. We really, and those two drugs weren't available when this program started here. The other thing is this program started here before we had a problem with fentanyl. Fentanyl came after. This was not a response to the fentanyl crisis. The fentanyl crisis has perhaps been fueled by this or at least certainly hasn't been in any way prevented by what we are doing in London. It is not a response to the fentanyl crisis. So what I'd be saying to other communities is look at the four pillars. Make sure you have adapted good programs in everything. The first pillar is prevention. We really need to be working on prevention and that includes mental health counseling, trauma care, intergenerational trauma care, and also we know that the best way to prevent things is to decrease accessibility and availability. When you add something that's going to increase that, you are going to have an increase in the people who are suffering. The next, is, next pillar is treatment. I really think we need to be enhancing all of the treatment options that we have available for people, particularly a fast, rapid response when people know that they're ready to be going into treatment. The next pillar is harm reduction. And I think that it's important to have access to safe, safe paraphernalia. Supervised consumption sites can be an important 
um, part of that, particularly if they are a, a sort of gateway into treatment and work well and are engaged with the community. The last is enforcement. It's one we don't talk about much anymore. But to be able to deal with the fentanyl crisis, we have to deal with fentanyl. And to deal with fentanyl, we have to be looking at ways to stop the flow of fentanyl into communities, not just try to pretend it's not there by throwing more drugs at the problem. Thank you so much, Doctor. I really appreciate it.